So we have one chapter down and 13 more to go. So we start with chapter four, this time with section one of life in the colonies. And we're switching from where basically it was almost a death sentence to come to the new world. How are they going to figure out how to survive? How are they going to live? To now them thriving and starting to take over more and more land and eventually going to affect the French, which causes a war at the end of this chapter. So things that are definitely on this test include subsistence farming, which we'll get to pretty quickly, and then also triangular trade and the middle passage, which are a package deal. These go with an essay question. And this is one of two essay questions in this section. And the very next one uh, is on the very next page. So we'll learn about that one first, it's just there's no key term that goes with it. So this really is, as the essential question says, uh, how geography and the way that the different parts of the country are laid out between soil and rivers and open land versus mountains, those things really affect the development of the three different colonial regions. And that's kind of how we get uh, businesses in the north, uh, some farmland in the middle, and then huge plantations at the very bottom in the south, which is why we get to all of this stuff about slavery. That very first essay question, once again on this test there's three, and you're going to choose two of them. So this is essay question number one, is about population. And population, from the time period we started learning, has now gone up by two million people. And that's a lot, especially for that time period. African Americans, uh, or basically they would just be Africans at this time period, because America really wasn't America yet, uh, have gone up as well. They've added almost a half million to the African population. And that is key because all of these half million Africans are in the South, which is what this essay question is really about. This chart down here shows you how the huge population spike of Europeans is countered by the drop in Native American population to almost nothing. And then there's also a red line down here that shows you that the African population stays the same. And that's because this map and the essay question focuses on population in the northern colonies. And when you look at it, the European population goes up. The African population stays the same at basically zero, and the Native American population goes down. And there's reasons behind that. The European population goes up because of the fact that there's constantly more Europeans coming in every day to the new colonies. It's safer to uh, live. It's, you're able to make money now. They're getting more and more land, so they're able to survive. And because they're able to survive, that means the Native American population goes down, way down. They keep taking, the Europeans keep taking the Native American land, especially in the north, and driving them further and further west or just killing their tribes off. And the African population in the northern colonies stays the same, at basically zero. And that is because there's very little farming land in the north. They can't have giant massive plantations, therefore they have no need for slaves. So all of that half million population growth is in the south. So when the essay question asks you about the African American or the African population in the north, you can say that it stays relatively the same at very low numbers because of the fact that they don't use slaves for their work. They're using people that live in the north that are actually being paid and being treated as people rather than the African slaves. And we'll get to later on with the triangular trade how they get here. The way that towns are set up in New England, they're kind of set up like targets and not the store targets. They're set up like shooting targets. Where in the middle is basically everywhere where people would meet. It'd be at churches, the town meeting hall. Uh, you could have a market there where you could trade goods would be the direct center of town. The next level would be basically the green zone and where people would start living would be in these outer rings where you would have huts that look like this. You probably wouldn't have windows though. Those wouldn't exist yet really. Uh, you would have maybe like an opening but in shutters you could shut them. 
Uh, but usually you would have a hut with a one, one room, uh, nothing really in there. Your bed would be in a corner, probably like a hammock hanging on a wall. You might have a hole cut out of your roof uh, and, a, and a fireplace type thing underneath of it so the smoke could get out. And you would have just one door in and one door out. And you would also have a small little farm uh, in front of your house, kind of like a garden type thing. If you have a garden in your house that's pretty advanced, it would look very similar to that. And they call this subsistence farming where you're just growing food for you, enough for you and your family. You're not going to be selling any of this food. You're not really going to be trading it. So you would have things like a couple tomato plants, a couple stalks of corn. You might grow some potatoes and some carrots and some onions. You might have a chicken pen with a couple of chickens in it. But you don't have a full-fledged farm. You're basically growing food to eat, and that's pretty much all you're growing. You're not going to try to make a living off of this. And instead of using slave labor, they rely on child labor, which we talked about indentured servants before, and how basically if you are being provided housing, you're being provided food, you're being provided clothing, and they expect people expect you to do chores for that, you can be called an indentured servant, which many of these kids would basically be considered indentured servants. And in New England, they would also have in these northern colonies, they would have small businesses, not large businesses. Those will come down the road once we get to the Industrial Revolution after the War of 1812 and before the Civil War when things start progressing and machinery starts becoming a thing. But before machinery, they had to use water. And they would use water to run water mills. And it's basically a wheel that spins because water is hitting it. And that wheel is attached to an axle. That axle is inside the building. That axle spins wheels in there. So you're able to do things like grind grain and cut lumber. You're able to put uh, any attachment to that spinning wheel to make a job go faster. So they're able to have small shops. You could be a blacksmith. You could be a gunsmith to make weapons. You could be a metalsmith to make metal things. You could be a shoemaker, which they called cobblers. You could have a small business. Uh, the problem is you cannot do this in the South. And there's a major reason why you can't do this in the South. And that is because most of the people in the South are slaves. So they have no money. And if a vast majority of your population you're trying to sell to doesn't have money, then you can't really make any money yourself. So no businesses went South. And that's going to be a huge problem when we get to the Civil War because all they really have is cotton. And you can't just kill people with cotton. So when they get to the war and they don't have enough weapons, all they have is cotton. They can't eat it. They can't shoot it at, at people. It uh, becomes a huge problem for them, and it's one of the major reasons why they lose the Civil War, and that is a hundred years in the making. We're right now in the early to mid-1700s, and that war will not happen until the mid-1800s, so that is something that affected them just based off of their landscape of things that were available to them, affected them a hundred years later where they didn't have any preparations in order to go to war. The other thing they have in the north a lot is forests. They have a lot of trees they can cut down, so they're able to build a lot of ships. And because of that, they become a boating community. This is why you can get a lot of seafood up in the north. It's a part of that culture. And they would also hunt whales because whale uh, blubber has a lot of oil, and that's how they would uh, light things. Uh, you would have uh, basically a piece of rope and you would have that dipped in oil and the rope would suck up the oil and the oil is flammable. So they would have oil canteens, it would basically be their lights that they would have in their house would be made of whale oil. And they just came out with uh, a movie about whale hunting uh, that you could watch and it shows you that crazy process of trying to row, row boat up to a whale and then harpoon it and then bring it back to shore. And then this colonial trade stuff is the second essay question and might be one of the most important essay questions of the entire year, where this is essay question number two of the section, and then we only have one more left that we need to get to in the other three. And that's because a lot of these places were used for shipping, and they would trade a lot of stuff on those shipping routes. And eventually, the major thing that is traded is slaves. And they called this whole trade route the triangular trade route. And it's because it forms a triangle. And if you think about one point being southern United States, the West Indies, the Caribbean-ish area, another point being Europe, 
And then a third point being the western coast of Africa. Those three points make up a giant triangle where they would trade uh, basically Africans and slaves would be coming from Africa to what we now call the Americas. They would send goods back. So things like cotton and tobacco would go back to Europe and Europe would then buy those things with money and guns. And then they would trade those money and guns to the Africans for more slaves. And I'm gonna get into why the Africans were actually basically enslaving themselves and when you look at this map a little bit closer, you can see that this basically covers the entire Atlantic Ocean from one point to the next and includes three major continents and a huge production of goods. And a lot of it is because of the fact that slaves are working for free and now everyone in the entire triangle can make a ton of money except for the slaves because everyone is taking advantage of them. And the way that this worked is that enslaved Africans would be marched to the western port, those western coasts of Africa. And this would be because the African tribes were constantly warring. So if tribe A fights tribe B and tribe B loses, tribe B is now going to be slaves and trade, tribe A gets guns and money for the slaves that they took from tribe B. And now that makes tribe, B, uh, tribe A more powerful. Tribe A can now go and beat tribe C, get more guns and money. Then they can go beat tribe D and get more guns and money. So each time they win, they're enslaving the people that they beat, trading them to make themselves more powerful. Uh, and they would have ropes tied around them. They would be traded to those Europeans for guns and money. They would be branded. Basically, they're being labeled with a scar, saying that they belong to that group, whoever bought them. That way, if someone runs away, you know that they have that scar, that they were yours. And then they would take the month or so long journey tied together all the way across the Atlantic Ocean they can't stand, they can't sit, they're not really given food. If someone is sick, they're thrown overboard because if one person gets sick, they're all getting sick. So you need to take out the person that is sick before they infect the entire rest of your uh, basically products that they are trying to make of slaves. And then they would be sold on a slave market. And they would be, uh, basically if you've ever seen a dog show before, they would be examined. They would check their uh, muscle structure. They would check their teeth. They would check to see if they're healthy, check to see how strong they are. And then they would be bought by plantation owners to then work on the plantations. And during uh, this basically whole slave trade time period from the 1400s to the 1800s, and right now in the middle of the 1700s where we're at is kind of the height of the slave trade, 12 million Africans are taken from their homeland and forcibly sold to American people, whether it be in uh, South of North America, or it could be South America or Central America, are buying all of these slaves and making them work on giant farms. And this picture kind of just gives you a, a, a sense of what it would be like, where it's basically like you're at a, uh, at a store with shelves. And on the boat, you would have as many slaves as you could packed into a small area under the bottom of the boat. So they would line up basically giant bunk beds and then have people just slot in and they would be chained together. That way no one could really move or get out. And then that way they could pack as many slaves in per trip as possible because it takes a really long time to get them from one side of the ocean to the other. And the middle colonies, they don't have huge farms. It's a warmer climate and it is a better soil climate so they can make things like giant farms worth of corn and giant farms worth of uh, tomatoes. They can make giant farms worth of carrots. Uh, they have that ability to do that. So they were able to sell these and that's why they call these cash crops because the goal of these was to make money. So you would make money and then you would buy the rest of your goods. And at this point in time, uh, the two largest cities are Philadelphia and New York. 
and uh, they're probably the two most important cities that we're going to talk about during this time period, them and Boston. Once we get to chapter 5 and 6, Boston becomes really important because they're kind of the reason why the American Revolution starts. So Philadelphia, New York, Boston will be our three key areas moving forward. And Philadelphia and New York are basically in the middle colonies. Boston is in the northern. In the middle colonies, they could also have jobs. Carpentry does not mean that you make carpet. This just means that you build stuff, usually with wood. And then they would have other businesses, including mining, which is something that still kind of exists today in our middle part of our country, right where we're at, is huge uh, mining fields. And it's something that is a part of the presidential election today, is, is mining still an actual thing that we should be doing, or should we be focusing on renewable energies? So that's something that comes up even today and was a big deal back in the 1700s. And then the huge part about this is the middle colonies had diversity. And there's one reason really for that, and it was William Penn and Penn's philosophy of being a pacifist. That you are going to basically be nonviolent and allow other people to settle near you. And that's why when you look at this giant wheel of different diverse places, you have almost 50% English, almost 20% slave, and then you have Scotch, uh, the Scottish people, the Scotch-Irish is what they call them, Scottish, Irish, German. Uh, you have the Dutch, the French, the Swedish. Uh, these are all other countries that are coming over during this time period that are making up about 30% of the entire population. And a lot of that takes place in the middle colonies based off of Penn's teachings that you would be tolerant of people around you. In other places, they were not tolerant of the diversity and the different cultures that would be settling near them, but these middle colonies kind of always had that uh, ability to accept and that wanting to accept other people and their differences. In the South, and this is where we get, if you remember back in the, uh, way back in chapter three, when we talked about uh, the trick to saying alive was tobacco, rice, indigo and cotton so that's the trick to surviving back then the south has the ability they have rich soil that's very fertile they have a warm climate and a long growing season and they don't have anyone to buy things so you can't really make products so instead they just farm and that does become a huge problem for them tobacco is the most important cash crop in maryland and virginia but we're going to get to eventually how rice rice is the key one that is really big and the most profitable because you can eat this and you cannot eat any of the other three. The major problem is that these giant plantations do require a great deal of labor. And because they don't have any money to pay anyone really, that's why they turn to slaves. So they eventually start off, or they start off with the indentured servants, but eventually switch to African slaves to do this work for free. And this allows them to sell their product for cheap and still make a ton of money. So since no one in the colonies really has a lot of money, they're able to still have a market because they don't have to pay anyone any money to do their work. That's all free for them. And then they would sometimes have a surplus. And a surplus is an extra amount. And if you think about when you eat dinner uh, and you guys get done and there's food left over, uh, that is a surplus of food. So now you can use that food later on. And we're going to get into eventually supply and demand, where uh, if you have a surplus, prices actually drop. Because if you have too much of a product, then that means that other people are willing to pay less for it. They know that you have a lot. They know that you can't sell it all. And that means they're going to drop the price. But on the opposite side, if you have a very limited amount of something, and Apple does this really well with iPods or I, like iPhones and iPads whenever they make new ones, they only make like a thousand to start with. And then everyone's willing to pay a really high price because they want to be one of the first ones to buy that product. If they made a billion iPads and iPhones, then you're not going to pay a whole bunch of money because you know they need to sell them all. So you're going to wait and you're going to wait until they only have uh, a whole bunch left until they lower the price. So that supply-demand thing we'll talk about a lot this year, having enough of a product to get people to buy it, but not too much of a product, too much surplus, where people will wait until you drop the price. 
And this is where that main crop, the most profitable crop, is rice. So that R in trick, this is what made them money. This is the thing that was most profitable to them. And growing rice is a very difficult process. You need to flood fields, you need to be constantly maintaining it, and it's the south, it is hot, it's humid, there's now mosquitoes everywhere because you just flooded fields and mosquitoes like stagnant water. So now they are becoming a major problem where you're out in the sun all day. If you're a slave, this is definitely not fun. You're not getting paid. It's hot. It's humid. You're getting sunburned all the time. You're constantly being attacked by bugs. Uh, rice grows like, like two to three feet off the ground, which is similar to cotton, that you need to be bending over all the time or on the ground to pick it up. So slavery is way worse just because of the conditions that these people were living in, other than the fact that they were basically treated like property and not paid anyway. Eventually it switches to tobacco, and then eventually as well cotton. So we'll get to the point where those places start making a ton of money because they're taking advantage of slaves. And then luckily, luckily for us, uh, you guys learn about this in seventh grade, plantations were basically manor systems. You would have a main house in the center, and then around it you would have slave quarters, you would have cabins that you would just throw all of your slaves into, they didn't have their own houses. You would have barns, you would have a blacksmith on like staff that would live on your plantation, you could have kitchens, you could have shops, you could have like a tiny little market that you would usually have the slaves run so that way other people could come in and buy stuff. You would, have a, you would have like basically a place that would be a school for your kids as a plantation owner. Your kids wouldn't be able to travel to school, so you would bring tutors that would live with you instead of having them leave and go somewhere else. So basically everything that you can imagine in a manor system basically is exactly the same way. Uh, and they called those places Tidewater, and that's the plantation and everything that involves a plantation uh, house to make, or a plantation system to make that plantation run and be able to make money. The other parts of the South were called backcountry, uh, and I always think of backcountry like those shows on uh, A&E or TLC or whatever they are on now, where like they go like hunting for alligators, or they all they do all day is like roam around the woods and like try to like find Bigfoot or something. Uh, that's like the backcountry. It's basically people that live out in the middle of the mountain areas of the Appalachian Mountains in the forest out there, and they don't really talk to anyone. Uh, they kind of live off the grid. And they would usually maybe have one or two slaves that would kind of live with them and work with them and help them survive, but these places do not have huge amounts of slaves like plantations would. Because most of these slaves are on plantations, uh, and this would be the best job if you could get a housework job. Usually that was saved for elderly women and kids. You would do work in the house, like make food and clean. Uh, and then the worst part is the working in the fields, is that those conditions are definitely not great. Uh, they're not fun. You're not getting paid. They're pretty terrible. And then the plantations would have an overseer, and that basically is just a boss. It's a person that is in charge of keeping the slaves working. Whenever you see movies or TV shows that deal with slavery, it is the fact, it's that guy that's on the horse with the whip that wanders around the fields and making sure that all the slaves are doing the job that they want them to do. And eventually, people in the South make slave codes. And slave codes are actually rules that basically make slavery worse. It's things that they say are going to govern the behavior and punishment of the slaves. So colonies eventually start writing their own laws because they are operating as separate colonies, not as one country yet. So Virginia starts it and it starts to spread. And there's reasons why they would do things like this. Why they would have that you can't leave the plantation without a written note. So you need a note from your so you basically need a bathroom pass to go off the plantation. So you need the handwritten letter from your slave owner that you could leave. And sometimes they would do that. They would send them into town or into a market to, in order to get supplies. So they would write them a note and say, I'm allowed to be here. And then they would be allowed to get what they needed and go back. And then they also made it illegal to teach slaves to read and write. And this is key because if you don't know what's happening to you, then you don't know that it's wrong. 
So if they can't read or write, if someone tries to write to them and says slavery is bad, they can't even read that. So they don't know that that's even a problem. If you can keep people, people ignorant about what's happening around them, if you keep them unknowledgeable about that stuff, then it makes it very easy to take advantage of them. And then it also made it illegal for them to move freely or assemble in large groups. And this ends up being an amendment to our Constitution, that you are allowed to have the freedom of assembly. It's in number one of our Constitution, which we'll go over with Mrs. Fugate in a few days from now, where number one says you have the freedom to gather in large groups. And the reason that was a problem back then was because when you gather in large groups, you start putting pieces of the puzzle together. You start talking with other people and realizing how much you're being taken advantage of. So this allows them to basically separate all the slaves and make sure that they never learn anything. And then you are whipped for minor offenses and you would only be killed for a really serious crime. And usually that was if you tried to rebel and you tried to lead a rebellion, would you be killed? Because it's easier for them to kill the leader and make everyone go back to doing what else, uh, doing what they're supposed to be doing. Where if you were doing anything else, they actually want you alive. And they play this really weird game where they want you to be smart enough and strong enough to do the job they want you to do. But not so smart and not so strong that you can figure out what's happening to you and get out. So they would basically always try to make you physically weaker as a punishment or try to break you mentally as a punishment. That way you go back to just doing the work you're supposed to do. Remember, they bought you, they spent money on you, so they really actually need you to be doing that work. So just killing slaves for the fun of it wasn't really something they would do. That would really just be to make sure that no one is being a leader and trying to get them to rebel against you. And even though the African slaves had horrible, horrible times, uh, and the conditions were terrible and they were treated like property uh, or more like garbage in most cases, they still try to keep some semblance of their regular life. Uh, they would keep traditions and they would try to eventually get out of being a slave. Some of them would try to learn some trade like being a blacksmith or being a carpenter to build stuff out of wood uh, and they could if they learned to trade, make those things for their plantation owner, and then the plantation owner would get those profits. And they were told that if you saved enough money, you could buy your freedom. But the problem is, is that they don't really know what the concept of money is. So if you told them if you save $10, you can be free, it's going to take them 10 years to save $10. And once they save $10, you can just say the price went up. So very rarely would you actually be able to buy your freedom. It's just that case of a very key word we're going to talk about a lot moving forward in chapters 5 and 6, giving people hope. Without hope, then you can't really keep going. So if slavery is just this horrible, ridiculous thing that you're never going to get out of, then why do the work? Sit down and do nothing. Where if you tell people that there is the possibility they become free, you give them uh, that incentive to want to do something, they're going to stick with it longer and they're going to attempt to do a job that they think they can eventually get out of. Uh, a lot of the, the Southerners in the, the white Southerners in the South, uh, they were not actually slave owners, but this is the key part. Even people in the North that didn't like it, economically they needed it. Without slaves, the country never actually can get started. They always say that America is built on the backs of slaves, and that's because no one really has money to buy anything at first. So they're basically given a, uh, basically a loan from the slaves. You can use this free workforce to get the country off the ground, and a lot of people, even though they didn't like it, they were accepting of it. Even the Quakers condemned it. They didn't try to tell people that they needed to get rid of them, they just said that it was bad to own it. But they were willing to still take advantage of that. And today, that's still a major problem. There is child slavery all over the world. Uh, a lot of the shoes, if you check your shoes, if you're wearing them right now, uh, or check ones that are in your room, 
They are most likely made in places like Indonesia or Vietnam or Thailand or China, where they use children to do the work to make those shoes, where they get paid like a quarter a day, and you're paying $100 for a pair of shoes that a kid got paid a quarter to make. So it really doesn't work that well today even, and it's not gonna, it's gonna take until eventually people like people in America that buy all those products are able to stand up and say, we no longer will accept you doing that, we'll pay more money for our products, which is something that is a time period we will eventually get to this year, right before the Civil War. And then once we get into uh, more positive things, other than all about slavery in section two, and then eventually into the French and Indian War later in this chapter.